Willkommen! Bienvenue! Oh my god, hey! Welcome back to my theatre-themed YouTube channel. My name is Mickey Joe, and I am obsessed with all things theatre, which is why, right now, I am spending two weeks in New York seeing as many Broadway shows as possible, including one of the most talked about openings of the 2023-2024 Broadway season. I am talking about the highly anticipated Broadway transfer of the West End revival of Cabaret. Directed by Rebecca Frecknell, this production has just opened at the Kit Kat Club at the August Wilson Theatre. It not only revives the show on stage, but it provides the audience a luxury, immersive pre-show experience, complete with an additional cast of Prologue Company performers and multiple different themed bars. There's plenty for us to talk about in this video. For those of you who know nothing about Cabaret and this revival, I'm going to be giving you all of that backstory, but also if you are coming to this video as a fan of the West End production, someone who has seen the West End production, I will be letting you know the differences between that one and Broadway, because even though they are ostensibly the same production with the same creative team, there are a lot of differences. It hits different people, let me tell you. And of course, we're going to be talking about the cast, led by Eddie Redmayne as the MC and Gail Rankin as Sally Bowles. So stay tuned for my full thoughts on Cabaret at the Kit Kat Club. I am so excited to bring you this review, but I'm also very excited to know what other people thought of it. If you have seen this production already at the August Wilson Theatre on Broadway, comment down below with what you thought. Finally, if you enjoyed today's video, make sure to subscribe to my theatre-themed YouTube channel, as well as going to find me on other social media platforms. You can find more of my theatre content on X, on Instagram, on TikTok. You can find shorter reviews of other shows that I don't necessarily talk about on here, as well as photos and essay-length paragraphs. But for now, I am very excited to be talking about Cabaret. Let's get into it. So, Cabaret was a 1966 Broadway musical with a score by John Kander and Fred Ebb, whose work you may also know from Chicago. It featured a book by Joe Masteroff, and it was based on the 1951 play I Am a Camera, which was an adaptation of the 1939 novel Goodbye to Berlin by Christopher Isherwood. All of the pieces having this sort of a loosely autobiographical narrative about him, a novelist, arriving in Berlin and meeting an eccentric character named Sally Bowles. I read the novel for the first time when I was younger, and there are differences between that and Cabaret, but they have that much in common at least. In the stage musical Cabaret, that novelist protagonist is Clifford Bradshaw, an American, who is arriving in Berlin because he's already tried Paris, and he is hoping to find creative inspiration for his next novel. And to do this, he finds himself drawn to some of the city's seedier and more tawdry characters, which is how he meets Sally Bowles. Sally, originally from London, is working as the headline act of the Kit Kat Club, a seedy nightclub presided over by a sort of mysterious, enigmatic, and yet charming MC. Sally is enjoying a hedonistic lifestyle, she is also living above the club because she's sleeping with its owner, and this is how she's travelled her way across Europe. But when Cliff arrives at the club on New Year's Eve, the same night that she is unexpectedly fired and simultaneously evicted, she ends up begging him to let her stay with him. He is staying at one of the modest rooms run by Fräulein Schneider at the Nollendorf Platz. She is a very resilient German woman who has lived an extraordinary life and is charmed by one of her residents, Herr Schulz, a local Jewish proprietor of a fruit market. And so we have Cliff and Sally's story, the two of them being young and perhaps a little bit naive and waking to the reality of what's happening in the city and the country around them, because this is set in late 1930s Germany. Obviously, there are many political undercurrents at play here with the rise of fascism. In fact, I say late 1930s, this may actually be early 1930s. I believe it's post-Wall Street crash, but it's definitely pre-Nazi Germany, but imminently so. We also have Fräulein Schneider and Herr Schultz and their story, which gives us another very different perspective on what's happening in the country. And in the background to all of this, you have performances taking place in the Kit Kat club and this MC figure who is not so much a character with their own personality but used in different productions of the show to represent different ideas. Is he another victim of the incoming fascist regime? Does he represent the country? Does he represent Berlin? But we cut between these brilliantly written book scenes that are filled with social relevance to these playful, suggestive musical numbers that toy with the same idea. When Cliff agrees to let Sally live with him, the MC then performs Too Late a song about living in a menage. There's a song called Money, about the realities of financial hardships. There's a song in which the MC dances with a gorilla in the second act, which has this blistering punchline about, you know, drawing a relationship between the idea of him 
dating a gorilla with the Jewish and non-Jewish relationships and how they were perceived at the time in anti-Semitic society. But it is a masterpiece of a musical. I think it's one of the greatest ever written. It has also been often revived. Some of the most high profile revivals include one that originated at the Donmar Warehouse in London, but then became much better known on Broadway with Alan Cumming starring as the MC, uh, various notable replacements in that role, as well as in the role of Sally Bowles. That production was then remounted again years later. So New York has a very strong memory of and a fondness for that production, which was directed by Sam Mendes. Much like the current revival of Chicago, it's that production that sort of changed how everyone perceives the show. In London, meanwhile, there was a mid-2000s revival by current artistic director of the National Theatre, Rufus Norris, that played in the West End and has then toured extensively, came back into the West End. But in 2021, we were going to get another cabaret when Rebecca Frecknell opened this production at the Kit Kat Club at the Playhouse Theatre. So let me tell you a little bit more more about that production and what it has become on Broadway. So the conceit of this whole version of the show is that we are recontextualizing this theater as the Kit Kat Club, and they go as far as to actually rename it in London. They do so slightly more loosely in New York, I think because August Wilson was an actual person and like renaming Playhouse Theater to Kit Kat Club doesn't feel quite as personal. But rather than entering into a traditional theatrical setting, audiences are invited to enter the space via the stage door in London. That meant then going through this subterranean entrance, getting offered a shot and then right rising up through these different bar spaces that were created inside. Bar spaces that were meant to conjure the idea of the Kit Kat Club in 1930s Berlin. They were selling Toblerone and lots of champagne and pretzels. And you also had a company of prologue performers. These were separate to the cast of the show and they would perform in these immersive spaces. There was lots of movement and dance and musicianship. They would sort of drift around in a very ethereal way and then occasionally come together for these flash mob style performances in a couple of locations. I will tell you about how that works in New York momentarily because it's mind blowing. But all of this is to ready you for the fact that when you get into the auditorium, it's set up to appear like the Kit Kat Club. And it is staged sort of in the round, but largely in traverse with seating on either side of the stage and uh, multiple rows of cabaret tables around this circular stage. There isn't a great amount of scenery to speak of. The stage does have multiple levels that rise up and down and revolve. But that I would say is the conceit of the thing. In terms of the creative approach to the material, there are a couple of differences with previous incarnations. Cliff feels, just in general, having seen this production six or seven times, a little more sidelined as a character. There is much more of a focus on Sally and the MC. She's this explosive, like I said, hedonistic and impassioned, but politically naive or perhaps deliberately ignorant young woman. But there's also a vulnerability to her as well for all of her protestations and insistence that nothing really phases her and she does this all the time. You can see how much it affects her emotionally when she goes through some challenging experiences. And by the end of the piece, when she is screaming out the title song Cabaret, it's clear that she is undergoing a trauma. Does that represent her rageful, frustrated insistence that she's going to live the way she wants to no matter her circumstances? Does it represent her simultaneously having an abortion? Choose your own adventure. As for the MC, this is probably the boldest departure from previous versions of the material because there have been versions of it where he feels sort of like a queer character where he feels part of this creative nightlife of the city and he is one of many who will be personally impacted by the incoming Nazi government. But in this version with Eddie Redmayne originally in the role, it feels very much like the MC is, like I mentioned, representative of the spirit of Berlin and of the city and of the country. At the beginning, he is very welcoming, very inviting both to the audience and to Cliff as he whispers to him, welcome to Berlin. And he is all charm and smiles and laughs and jokes. He performs exuberantly among all of the Kit Kat Club dancers. The way that he is costumed is colorful. But as the thing progresses, there is this creeping sense of menace. And by the show's second act, when he sings the song, I don't care much, his appearance has changed. He's wearing sort of a duller suit. He has a blonde wig. He looks very much 
like the the fascist ideal in Nazi Germany. His physicality has become more intense and severe. His delivery has become a lot more bold and striking. The way that he seizes Sally during this number, the way that he speaks with Cliff in their final interaction, it is all a lot more tense. And these are all features that the two different versions of the show, West End and Broadway, both have in common. Let me tell you specifically about how the thing has been adapted for New York. If you've seen it in the West End, then you'll want to stay and listen to this. So it's not subterranean, but we again enter through the side and then round the back of the building. You are offered a shot of schnapps on arrival, and they still have multiple bar spaces. They have a gold bar, also called the vault bar, which is the lowest of the three levels. It's similar to the gold bar that you have in the West End production, but it and everything about the inside of this theatre is just wider, is just bigger. Where the West End, in quite an intimate space, feels like it's capturing this Berlin nightclub, uh, slightly seedy, slightly dark aesthetic, Broadway feels like more of a luxury experience for the actual people in 2024 in New York who have paid a lot of money to be there, which is probably smart, honestly, and it feels a little less claustrophobic, it feels a little more grand. The West End Theatre has unisex toilets, the Broadway Theatre does not, so they have signs that say Darman and Heron, which I like, that's just a nice detail. They have this glorious gold eye with a spinning disco ball in the middle. The eye is a whole aesthetic of this production, and they're also drawn on the walls all over the August Wilson Theatre. The way that they have just subtly transformed the corridors and the stairwells of this building, which I went to before when I went to see Funny Girl uh, last year, is remarkable. In that gold bar, they're selling the same snacks that I mentioned to you before. You can get pretzels, you can get Toblerone, you can also get a handful of specialty cocktails. Uh, there's one called, like, a spot of gin. There's another one, I think, called the American Novelist. You can get champagne by the glass or by the bottle, depending on how much of an evening you want to have. And you can also, like in the West End production, buy food packages if you want to have a whole entire immersive evening at the Kit Kat Club. Now, it was an 8pm curtain when I went. I got there at 6.45. Uh, which I think was good because there was an early, very exciting flash mob sequence downstairs in the Gold Bar. And I'll tell you more about this prologue company when I talk about performances later. But the dance was fantastic. It felt even more frenetic and urgent and a little bit contemporary, which I like. There is this sort of timeless quality because, you know, while they're transporting you to uh, 1930s Berlin, there's still free Wi-Fi at the same time and they're selling merchandise. So it's not like completely immersive, but you get the idea. So you had the musicians, you had the dancers on this enormous stage, and then at various levels throughout the auditorium, when you go up to the red bar, there's a space behind the bar area where there was a pianist and one of the prologue companies performing against some just very compelling dance. It was very sort of contemporary, very modern dance with vogue sort of elements, but a shade of Fosse inspiration as well, especially the way the whole thing is characterized. It's quite sardonic. It's quite just, again, intense really is the word. The highest level is a green bar, which is just gorgeous. Again, they're serving drinks. That's on the mezzanine level. And then when you go into the auditorium, it very much resembles what they did in the West End. It just feels wider and larger. Because in the West End, there isn't much space on either side of the stage, and the theatre just sort of goes back. And at the August Wilson, everything opens out a lot more. They don't go as far up. There are three levels on the main side of seating in the London production, and there are only two on either side on Broadway, because they don't have that upper circle level. Of course, they still have the cabaret tables that you can book for a luxury experience. You can eat there, and you can have bottles of champagne at your table. They have little lamps on them that light up at different moments throughout the show. The cast will interact with you loosely during the show because, you know, they're still performing a book musical and it's not interactive the other way. There was a woman escorted out for trying to touch Eddie Redmayne, like getting up out of her chair and walking towards the stage. Obviously, we're civilized people and we're not doing that at the theatre. Come on now. But the other interaction you may get is with the prologue company. So when we went into the auditorium, we were up in the mezzanine level and there was at first one and then a second member of the prologue company just sort of walking around again, doing this very ethereal movement, walking across the armrests of empty rows of seats and like gesturing to audience members who didn't initially realize that they were behind them. And then another prologue company member came up and had a playbill that they were playing with and they were doing 
this sort of a silly, uh, silent interaction between the two of them chasing each other around. It's all a very carefully and creatively curated atmosphere, which is one of the things I love about this production. The actual content of the show when it starts is really very similar to London. It's all about the arrival to that, which is where you find more of the differences. The way the audience responds to it, that is also very different, and I'll tell you a couple of those moments. There was a big old gasp at a particular reveal moment right towards the end of the first act. If you know the show, you know what I'm talking about, probably. And that surprised me, because Cabaret, like I said, was in New York for a very long time, that previous production. I kind of assumed everyone would already know that was coming. There are some introductory lines about, like, one of the Kit Kat Club dancers being an American, um, and when they talk about someone being British, and all of the jokes around Cliff being American and trying to pass off his accent as being either British or German, and, like, him being like, oh, everyone can instantly tell I'm American, that got a lot of laughs. The other thing I should say, and they will tell you this on arrival, is that you're not permitted to take photos or film inside the Kit Kat Club. Once you enter, they'll give you a nice little sticker that you can put over your phone camera. You're also not allowed to use the selfie camera, obviously. We are keeping it in the Kit Kat Club, people. But this is all really just an overview of the experience. What do I actually think of the show? Let me tell you first about the production, and then I'll tell you about the performances. So I really like Rebecca Frecknell's version of the show. I think it's tremendously creative and very politically charged. I think it's not necessarily the greatest production of Cabaret ever. I think there are things that the Rufus Norris production did in uplifting Cliff. I think there are things that the Mendez version did in empowering the MC, which had a little bit more potency for those characters. Certainly this one is largely about the MC and Sally, and like I said, Cliff feels a little bit sidelined, but what this production does so well is all of the Fräulein Schneider and Herr Schultz stuff. They have a tendency in previous ones to be a little bit relegated to the roles of older sort of grandparent characters. Whereas in this one, even though they are older and they talk about it extensively, you feel this passion between them. And to put it in a slightly vulgar way, you just really want them to go and hook up. You just, you just really root for that. When he gives her a pineapple from his fruit market and she is completely emotionally overwhelmed by this and they sing a charming song called A Pineapple about how taken she is with this exotic gift, there is a moment right at the end that is so inspired where she holds the bag open for him to put it back into the bag and he slowly places it in while they make like steamy eye contact and the whole thing is representative of like using a pineapple as a metaphor for intercourse. And prior to this production, never had I seen Cabaret and just was rooting for them to go and bang in the Nollendorf Platz. Literally, that's just what you want to happen. Another great decision that they make is in the role of Fräulein Kost. She in this production is also one of the dancers in the Kit Kat Club. She is Fritzi slash Fräulein Kost. And in general, it does character and motivation and sort of these shifts in society very well. I will also say of the staging that the way that they use that stage and the way they choose which moments to use the rise on, which moments they choose to use the revolve, and uh, sometimes it's whimsical, sometimes it has an awful lot of weight to it, sometimes the rise up of the MC is terribly sinister, sometimes it's playful, he appears through Sally Ball's suitcase wearing an imitation of her outfit. And one of the most striking visual moments of the show comes at the start of the second act, when the MC is sort of lingering around from Fräulein Schneider and Herr Schultz as they are deciding how to move forwards with their engagement. Just as he seems to be getting through to her and convincing her that they should go ahead with it anyway, a brick is hurled through the window of his store, smashing the glass, and the way that's done in this production is Eddie Redmayne as the MC wraps a glass in a small handkerchief and stamps on it, and there's a lighting effect, and uh, confetti pours down. It's incredibly striking. It's this whole crystal necked comparison. It's in little moments like that that you really feel Rebecca Frecknell's creative touch and its brilliance. Not all of the Kit Kat Club members I think necessarily land for me with as much power as they could. Two Ladies is done in a very fun and whimsical way. The opening is incredibly strong. If you could see her flies or sinks based on the charisma of the MC because it's just him performing it with a monkey. Something like Money tends to lose me a little bit just because I don't think there's anything really 
really uh, especially about the staging of that number that grabs me, or that offers much to it that hasn't been done before in previous productions. But there are winning bold choices made throughout in allowing Sally to be completely still when she sings Maybe This Time, a song that was added for the film and then subsequently put into the show. It identifies that particular musicalized monologue for her as an emotional aside that's a little more out of character and it changes her from being a romantic to someone who is just considering sort of out of character this idea and the possibility of doing something that she wouldn't necessarily have previously planned to. The staging of the title song Cabaret is ferocious and powerful and stirring, and the use of costuming is so interesting throughout, so creative. All of which is the work of Tom Scott, who did the scenic, theatre, and costume design. But like I said, they are so vibrant at the beginning, and then as we progress through the show, it becomes more dull and more homogenized and it is i believe representative of the idea of like the death of creativity and individualism and um i guess also like the the repression of the queer community in the wake of the rise of fascism which is not necessarily the most powerful story to tell previous productions have gone for really hard-hitting endings that are representative of the Holocaust, whether that's showing the MC as a queer character, or as a Jewish character, or as both, someone for whom the rise of the Nazis has huge personal consequences. But here, the final image that we are left with is with uh, everyone on this carousel just revolving around in uh, low light, facing forwards sternly, as though this is what the country has become and I think like it carries the weight of all of the implications that we as the audience know what is coming next I just don't know if it's the most powerful thing to draw out of that time or I'm entirely misinterpreting it and I have been for years when Sally performs cabaret she's in an ill-fitting suit the MC has some glorious costumes throughout he has this Pierrot style clown outfit that he wears he has this skeletal outfit with jewels creating the lines of his ribs when he's performing money that is very terrifying. But I do think, and partially just on the brilliance of this book and how great Rebecca Frecknell is at those book scenes and evoking the character and particularly in the Schneider stuff and the Schultz stuff and the Cost stuff, it remains a really great production of the show. I think there are some things it does better than the Mendes version, better than the Norris version, but there are other things that they brought to it as well. And that's what a revival is. I don't think it needs to be definitive and better than and the best one ever every single time. But what's exciting is that we've had a bunch of different cabarets and it invites different conversations by lending a different perspective. Of course, the other thing it brings is some very exciting performances. So let me tell you about the cast. Let's start with Eddie Redmayne, who I was lucky enough to see twice when he did the show in London. What comes across very clearly is the reverence that he has for this material and the understanding that he has for this material. And what's great about his MC that not everyone who has come after him in the role has been able to replicate is, like I said, the duality and the balance of the charm at the beginning and how charismatic he is and how winning he is and how effortlessly he earns the affection of everyone in that auditorium with the legitimate menace and intensity by the end. What's so fascinating in particular about his one that no one else has played on quite as much is the physicality and the way he actually holds himself. He was doing slightly more of like a hunching thing when I first saw the show in the West End. He's dialed that back a little bit but there are still a lot of quirks and oddities about his mannerisms and about sort of like the vocal affectations. He's doing it like the sort of a strange little alien man almost on occasion, which allows him to then dial it back when his posture improves, when he's playing a sort of a more conservative German by the end of the show. And then right at the end of the show, and I will never forget this because it's a really haunting visual, he is playing the, the ticket taker on the train with Cliff, and Cliff is saying he won't likely come back to Germany anytime soon, and he's saying, oh, did you not find our country beautiful? And there's a moment where he shifts back into the MC, and his his posture changes. He's been very upright and then a sort of a smile creeps across his face and he hunches back into it. There are shades of like brilliant movie villain like the Joker 
in there. There is, there's just so much dimension and so much nuance to his performance. The acting choices that he's making throughout are big and bold and blistering, but at no point when he is singing or when he is speaking is he just doing the material like we have seen with uh, some other people. He is finding so much depth and so much richness and so much color in it. I would say that his characterization has become a little bit broader as we have moved to Broadway. Everything feels just a little bit bigger. It takes a little bit of getting used to in the beginning when he's doing this sort of high-pitched Germanic vocal affectation and when he's doing all of this gesturing and Gail Rankin is not dissimilar as Sally. She's giving you a very big performance. So I've seen a lot of Sally's. I just recently saw Cara Delevingne in the West End production who surprised me with how strong I thought her performance was and Gail is an interesting other side to that coin because I said that Cara gave you this full ferocity and it was this very no holds barred soul exposing performance but she also captured the whole like political disinterest in this blase very casual oh don't worry about it darling while i'm chain smoking a cigarette thing very very well and gail feels a lot more passionate and a little bit mad and i like a lot of that a lot of it works but it is very different the adjective that kept coming to me when i was watching her performance was combative there was a sense of a rage and a frustration there and it allowed for some very interesting moments but it also was a little bit difficult to reconcile with the whole political apathy or deliberate ignorance or whatever it is however it is that you interpret that from sally because it's hard for her to not care about any of this and then you wonder where all of the frustration and the rage is coming from I do think there are moments where it's more effective to play her a little bit more laid back. As far as her sung performances go, Gail Rankin has a decent singing voice, but this production, uh, like others before it, has never really aligned with the idea of Sally being a fantastic singer. The first one that she does is Don't Tell Mama, and she comes out of the gate with a lot of energy. It is very intense. And that again, like moments in Eddie Redmayne's performance, I wonder if it's just a little bit too big too soon. When I first saw the show, Sally would come up on this lift with a cigarette in her mouth, she's dressed like a baby, and the song is like, don't tell mama that I'm performing at this racy nightclub. And the first word of the song is her saying, mama. And before she would take a cigarette out of her mouth and puff out a lot of smoke when she says, mama. And now Gail does it where she screams mama like a baby, and she kind of has that energy throughout the rest of the song. It's just a lot. And again, this may come down to a personal preference where I think I enjoy more a Sally who's like got a cigarette in her hand and she's like, I'm doing this number, I'm kind of phoning it in because she's not a great performer, but she's clearly having enough fun. Gail Rankin is performing as Sally like she is a third year drama school student doing a devised piece of theatre who thinks she's the most sensational actor that anyone has ever seen. It's just very committed and very intense and very big. Again, everything is a little bit broader for Broadway, and I think I just preferred that perhaps slightly British quality, where everyone is a little bit more, not disinterested, but just, like I said, laid back a little bit more repressed. It's not quite as obviously emotionally declarative. After Blanks and Wood played Cliff, I enjoyed his performance. Like I've said, there's not as much you can do with this character in this particular production of the show, but I thought in his relationship with Sally, particularly towards the end of the show, and there's one little restaged moment where before he went to hit her, when it finally dawns on him that she's just got back from having an abortion. And in this one, and I'm sure this is different, he like physically shouts at her as he's about to do it, and she does less to stop him, but then he breaks down and sobs on her shoulder. That was very powerful, and I think a better way of doing it, that can be a little bit of a sticky moment depending on who the performers are. As Herr Schultz and Fräulein Schneider, meanwhile, we had Steven Skybell and B.B. Newworth. B.B. was sensational. Of course, she is a Broadway legend, a Broadway legend of Candor and Ebb musicals as well. This was phenomenally good casting because every time she's talking about having lived a life and her experience and this slightly weary quality, it works on multiple levels. Particularly as we go into the second act, she is so heartbreakingly sorrowful when she's singing What Would You Do? It's a lovely inversion of the the charm and the just like getting on with it that she exemplifies in the first act when she's singing who cares so what hers will be remembered i think as one of the really tremendous performances of this particular broadway season i smell a tony nomination you heard it here first and most importantly she has a lovely rapport with stephen skybell who finds all of my favorite notes in herr schultz he is so 
charming. It really makes you really very devastated on his behalf. His ultimately misplaced optimism in the character of the German people and his situation as a Jew in 1930s Germany is really heartbreakingly played. Bibi also finds every single sarcastic line delivery as Schneider, whether that's with Cliff, whether that's with Fraulein Kost. She's hilarious and grounded and real and has depth. It's so good. I enjoyed Henry Gottfried as Ernst Ludwig. I thought he and Natasha Diaz would have both benefited from just a little bit more bite. The characters that they play come to be a very sinister presence in the show and I wanted just a little bit more attack from them. Some of the members of the prologue company that I want to mention because they were mesmerizing performers, Alaya, Ian Bryan, Will Irvin Jr. and Sun Kim, all utterly captivating dancers. And I didn't really get to see everyone. Those are probably the ones that I followed the most throughout the space, but just wonderful. The character of that prologue section is so well understood and so well characterized. It's, it's really a superb creative achievement as is this entire production, and it gets remembered as the Eddie Redmayne cabaret or the immersive cabaret, and it gets remembered for having high ticket prices and being this luxury experience. I'm here to tell you, it is really good. It is a fantastic night at the theater. They do justice to the sublime material. If you've never seen Cabaret, it's one of the great musicals. You have to go and see it on stage. I think this is as rich a revival of it as any, but it's all of the prologue stuff and it's that pre-show experience that really elevates this from being a fantastic piece of theater to a truly glorious theatre going experience. But those have been my thoughts on Cabaret at the Kit Kat Club at the August Wilson Theatre on Broadway. I am pleased to report that I think the show lands just as well here. I hope it goes on to have the same success here. The affection for the last revival notwithstanding, it is a very busy time on Broadway right now, but I dare say this is going to remain one of this season's best remembered new openings. Like I said, if you have been able to go and see this show already, let us know what you thought of it in the comments section down below, or if you're planning to go see the show, let us know that as well. Thank you so much for watching this video, I hope that you enjoyed. If you did, make sure to subscribe to my theatre themed YouTube channel for more reviews of West End and Broadway shows coming very soon. This is just one of like 20 shows I plan to see while I'm in New York, and if I'm not reviewing them on here, then you can go and find out what I thought about them over on my Instagram or TikTok pages. I'm at Mickey Joe Theatre all over the internet. I hope that everyone is staying safe and that you have a stagey day. For 10 more seconds I'm Mickey Joe Theatre Oh my god, hey Thanks for watching, have a stagey day Subscribe! <laughs>